Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depends on when you're watching this lecture. This is our lecture 6, 122 class, and in this, talking about class, we will continue to talk about classes and operator overloading, oh, right? Uh, let's see how far we get, uh, but these are the two topics that I want to cover. Um, classes, I did start talking about it, uh, but this is uh, a deeper look into classes. Um, I want to continue. I did men mention about the constructors. So in this one, I want to continue talking about the constructors um, and talk about the destructors um, and then jump into operator overloading. Uh, so constructors and destructors. Constructors, as you know, and as I've asked you, if there isn't one, if you don't put in a default constructor in the class, I shouldn't say default, if you do not add a constructor in the class, okay, the compiler will write one for you. Uh, there's no way to have a class without a constructor. Um, and the constructor is really important. And there are two types of constructors. One is a default constructor provided by the uh, compiler. Uh, and you know, sometimes folks even write a default, a, a default constructor for their class by themselves, uh, although it'll do nothing. Um, and then there is a constructor that takes in a bunch of parameters. Those are the two types of constructors. And I'll show examples of those. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is um, constructors are used to construct the classes. Destructors are used to free up the memory uh, on the classes. I shouldn't say de destroy. <clears throat> But let's say you've got a program, you created a class. When you're done with the program, the destructor will get called. Uh, what is a destructor? A destructor is a special member function of a class that's executed whenever object of its class goes out of scope or whenever the delete is applied uh, to a pointer that points to that object. Um, and when it comes to the naming convention, um, a destructor has the same exact name as the class, uh, except that it's got a tilde um, at the beginning of the name. Um, and it can neither return a value, nor can it take in any value. So this is important, right? Um, it shouldn't, so it it's returns void and it takes in void. So like no input and out, uh, no input and no return. And then destructors, typically you'll have uh, freeing up of the, uh, of the memory. Okay. Uh, having said that, let's jump into a few examples. And this one, uh, it's a class li line um, that's got a constructor that doesn't take in any parameters. Okay. So I say, so the class line is set length get length and the constructor um, you know typically when you do do this you'll have the constructor at the beginning uh, but it doesn't really matter uh, the order of the methods don't matter as long as the methods are there um, and it's got a double length method um, and then when it comes to implementing i'm implementing the uh, constructor first now remember in the last lecture I mentioned about the scoping operator the two colon um, so when I say line this way I know that this method belongs to the class line same here void line set length belongs to line class uh, and look at the constructor it doesn't take in anything all it's doing is it's saying object is being created and in my main function I say line.setLength is 6.0 uh, so watch what happens object is being created see before this method gets called the constructor is going to get called so when does the constructor get is going to get called now the moment you have this right here is when the constructor gets called. Watch.
right? Uh, that was the, um, and when it comes to the syntax of the constructor, the name of the constructor is the is the same name as the class, and it applies to both if uh, if it's a parameterized um, constructor or a regular one. I shouldn't say regular, one, but a, but a constructor that doesn't take in any arguments. Now in here, what I've got is the. same class but instead the constructor takes in a double okay and then it says object is being created um, blah 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 and then I've got a uh, set length get length and what okay. happens right. object is being created and length is equal to 10 that's because I passed in 10 Okay, uh, now I'm going to also have a constructor empty. Now watch, um, watch what happens. Get the syntax here. Empty constructor. And there. Now see, I've got an empty constructor, a constructor that doesn't take in anything. And a constructor that takes in something. Now, when I call, when I do this, how about if I do this? Object is being created, and length is equal to 10. That's because I call the constructor with an argument. Now, here, empty constructor, right? Why is that so? because I, the constructor with no parameter gets called for this one because nothing is, is passed in the parentheses of buttons. Right? So make sure you get the syntax right. You don't need to put parentheses, just the uh, name of the class and then the um, a variable name. So you can have multiple constructors of a class with parameter without parameter with one parameter with two parameters three four five whatever depends on your implementation now let's go to another one now i mentioned about destructors right so now in this one, I've got a constructor and I've got a destructor. Watch what happens. Object is being created, object is being deleted. Um, I called, the main, main method gets called, and when I say line, line, so the constructor is going to get called. And at the end of it, after you say, um, you know, the length of the line is this, so when the program ended, that's when the destructor got called automatically. You know, typically what you have is you have the freeing up of the memory. If you've got pointers in there, or if you got memory allocation, you'll clean those up in, in a destructor. So a constructor and a destructor, they actually have a purpose. Now, a destructor, I cannot emphasize this enough, the freeing up of the memory, because what's going to happen is, you know, C++ does a lot of memory management for you, uh, whereas C, you would have you'd have to actually allocate memory, then deallocate memory. Uh, but you know, and it's a general good rule that if you want to avoid memory leak, clean up memory in a destructor. Okay. Okay. So now, next thing I have in mind is to talk about friend classes and 
friend method. Now, a friend is someone that you're comfortable enough to share your private information with. Your friends know, um, I mean, some of the close friends would know the intricate details about your life, your secret things that nobody else knows. Um, well, when it comes to classes, um, it's similar. Uh, if you say class B has a friend, class A, class A will have access to the private and protected data members of that of its friend class. Okay. Now, you already should know uh, the three different types of uh, protection level, right? Public, protected, and private. Public members are those members or variables that are accessible by anyone inside the class, well, outside the class. It all pertains to outside the class. Protected are those uh, that can be accessed um, via the, uh, you know, derived classes. Private, only the class has access to it, those mem uh, to those variables or data members. And if you have a friend, that friend is going to have access to the protected. Public goes without saying. Protected and private methods and data members. Okay? Um, so you can have a friend class and you can ha also have a friend function. So if you're writing a class, you, you could have a function that's friend of the class and that function obviously is going to have access to all the um, private and protected uh, variables and methods a friend function can be a global one or it could be a member function of another class right um, global method are those methods that are declared up at the top and are available throughout the use within the entire file. Uh, let's uh, go over some of the examples of a friend class. So I've got a class called G, uh, GFG, okay? So it's got a private uh, variable and it's got a protected variable, right? And then I initialize the um, protected and private. Then I've got a uh, you know, in it, I'm saying that there is a class F, which is a friend of GFG. And this, now when it comes to this class representation, it's got a display method that takes in um, CFG by reference, right? And then it outputs the private and protected uh, variables for those. And then put the driver method in the friend function. Anyway, there's a parenthesis missing. I'm not going to debug it. But you get the point here. Um, it's going to be a minor one to fix. So if you get this sort of setup, and, and, the, and the keyword is friend, class F. That's how you know um, that it is a friend of the class. So if you set it in this manner, uh, let me see, let's see, uh, public GFG, I think this one is this one. Yeah. Yep, that's what we're missing. So in this class, I declared this friend, and then this one has a method here. So it has access to the private, protected and private methods. Now, now, let's look at a friend function. How does that work? So I've got a class called base, and then I've got a protected and private variable, and base has a constructor uh, that initializes a private and protected variable. But I've said there is a friend function that takes in the base class and it does something with it. That's a friend function. And then later on, when you have the implementation of the friend function, you output the private and protected members of it.
See, here again, you're able to output the protected and private mem data member. So this is a, uh, an important concept. Okay, so now let's get into operator overloading. Um, what is that? Did I cover the last Yeah. No, hold on. I got to cover static method. Um, I had some example in here. No, this is overloading. Okay, I'll just talk about static methods. Um, so static data variable and static functions. What are those? Uh, static is a keyword and static data members are, they're still data members but they have the keyword static in front of them. Now the, the special thing about the static thing is, if you've got a static data member and you have 10 objects of the class, there's only going to be one copy that's shared between 10 objects of the class. Um, and it's initialized before any object of the class is created. So before you create any object, the static data member is already initialized. Uh, it's only visible within the class, but its lifetime is the entire program. As long as you've got the driver program running, that's how long the data member, the static data member's lifetime is. Um, so, and the static member, uh, well, the static function, it's similar in the sense that there's only one copy of the static function that's shared amongst all the classes now, you know, the way I've used static in the past, um, let's say, for example, you're supposed to calculate the number of objects created for that class. How do you do that? Well, you're going to have a static counter in there, and you're going to have a static method in there. Um, well, I don't think you need, really need a static method, but you, you're going to have a static counter in there, um, and you're going to use the method to return a static counter. And every time the object is created, you're going to increment that static um, data member. So this way you're gonna know how many um, objects you have for a particular class. And the static function, there is an interesting piece to this. You don't need to have an object of the class to access the static member. Uh, so there's a slight difference. And it has its uses. Uh, this, the use of static is, is limited, at least the way I've used it, but it, it is very useful. You could have a problem um, could be a midterm question. Hey, how do you calculate the number of objects that have been in, instantiated for a class? You use static data member. Well, how do you go about accessing a member function without instantiating um, the class or creating an object for the class? Well, you use static data member, uh, static function. Okay, so now next up we have operator overloading. It's an overloaded term. Um, but the concept is, uh, once you get the hang of it, you will understand it. It's an idea of giving special meaning for an existing operator without changing its original meaning. Now, you know, when you use a string library, you've got one string and you've got another string. You want to uh, add the two strings together. Like, let's say you've got string one is hello, string two is world. You want to add the two to say hello world and you want to be able to do s string one plus string two and the moment you do that compiler is going to throw an error and say well i don't know how to add these two uh these two uh together because they're the type string so in situations like those in concatenation addition you are basically telling the compiler what to do if it encounters a plus sign for two string and the same goes for classes as well. You know, you've got class A, you've got class B. Uh, you want to try to, um, you know, try to add them up, concatenate them. Concatenate them. Uh, you go about using uh, the uh, the operator overloading. Um, we can overload binary operators, uni unary operators, and special operators, subscript operators. Uh, so almost all of the operators can be overloaded except size of, type ID, the scope resolution, the dot operator, pointer to a member function, 
the conditional operator, ternary, um, ternary, you don't have to worry too much about, but the conditional one, keep that in mind, the conditional operator that cannot be overloaded. Um, let's jump into a few examples for now. So, as I was telling you about a class, right? So you've got a class A, it's got a bunch of statements in it. And you, you got two objects, uh, you got, you know, so in this case, you've got A, A1, A2, A3. Well, you want to say A3 equals A1 plus A2. The compiler's not going to know what plus is. In situations like that, you would go about overloading an operator. So here, let's look at an example. You've got a class called complex, and you want to be able to add, concatenate um, two different complex objects. How do you go about doing it? And let's look at the syntax for a second. The syntax is literally the return type, okay, which is complex class, Operator plus. So you say operator plus, operator minus, whatever the operator is. Op the, the, the keyword operator, and then plus after that. And then what is it going to take in? Well, it is going to take in a reference to complex class. Right? Straightforward. Um, and then you say you've gotten this object right here. So you declare another complex class and then you add in the uh, the data members of it right so you've added the data members and then you return this new comp complex class um, and then there's a print method in there. so here I've got two complex classes right C1 um, whose two data members are 10 and 5 and then C2 2 and 4 and then I say I create a third complex class, which is C1 plus C2. Twelve plus I9. So when you do C3 dot print, what what happens? This was ten and five, and this was two and four. Ten plus two is twelve. Five plus four is nine. That's that's how you end up with twelve plus nine, right? The other way you could go about doing it is you could make uh, the operator plus a friend. See, you get a friend method in there that takes in two complex classes and then returns a comp complex class. So I made it a friend and then I say complex operator plus takes in two complexes and then I add in the, the data members. The data members were both integers that were called real and imaginary. C plus re C1 real plus C2 real and then C1 imaginary plus C2 imaginary. And then once again, I've got, you know, C1, 10 and 5, C2, 2 and 4, and then C3 equals C1 plus C2, and then I print. So what should happen? They should say 12, and they should say 9. Similar to the previous one. The end result is still, still the same, but instead of overloading it within the class itself, I made it a friend function, and I overloaded it in there. Uh, this is, um, you know, so you get, uh, this end result is still going to be the same, but this example is going to show you the use of this and the, uh, and the pointer, the arrow sign. Now, this is a keyword in C++. Anytime you type in this in C++, it means it refers to the class you're currently in. And if you want to get to its properties, you use this arrow sign. You know, if, if you didn't have this in there, real, you, 
if you just say real equals real, it's going to get confused. Right, because, um, and then this at imaginary equals to imaginary. Um, so that's how you use the this operator. And look at this over here. So I've got a operator plus. What it does is C3 is a new complex uh, number, right? So it does C3 dot real equals this dot real plus whatever it's taken in. You know, I'm literally pointing to myself. You can't really see me pointing to myself, but I hope you understand what this is. This is pointing to the class you're in. So this real dot C2 right here. And then C3 imaginary is equal to the, the current class that I'm in plus C2 imaginary and then return C3. And see what's going to happen. 3 plus 2 and then 5 plus 4. 5 plus 9. That's what you end up getting. Same, same end result, but just a different way of going about it. Now you can also overload uh, the op the conversion operator, right? So in he what's going on here? Look, let's let's go through this example, and um, hopefully it doesn't confuse you. So using namespace, you know, online C four. Yeah. Using namespace std, you've got a fraction class. Uh, it's got private members num and den, and then uh, they take in uh, the constructor takes in two parameters and initializes its data members to it. And then I've got a, a float operator, right? It returns float value of the fraction. These are integers, but it's going to return the float value of the fraction. So we have fraction f initialize it two and five. And then I say float of value equal to f, and then I output the value. So what I've done is I've converted, so I've converted this f, right, to a float. This might be a little confusing, but just, this is just so you know that you can do this. Those were the examples of the overload operator. Now, I told you what you can and cannot overload. So, so the operators that can be overloaded are the arithmetic operator, plus, minus, multiply, modulus, divide, unary operator, increment, decrement, assignment operator, equals to, plus equals, and other variant, even the bitwise operator, uh, dereferencing, right, the this at pointer that we use, dynamic memory, memory allocation, we haven't done this much um, because it comes from C, but that can't, the subscript operator, function call, logical and or or, the relational operator, all of these can be overloaded. Isn't it great to know? Some key points to remember about overloading. For operator overloading to work, at least one of the operate, operands must be user-defined class object. Right? Not your defined. Well, yeah, you, if you're the user, uh, so they're user-defined class objects. So you could have it on a, a system-defined object and then the other one should be use a different class object uh, compiler automatically creates a default assignment operator with every class um, but the default assignment operator doesn't assign all the members to the rights of the right side to the left side um, there is this concept of copy constructor right um, that we've done a lot in the past we meaning myself, I've done it in the past quite a bit, um, but I haven't shown you guys. Uh, but just keep this in mind that there is a default copy constructor that's provided for you. And at some point, we'll get into copy constructors. The conversion operator, we can also write conversion operator that can be used to con convert from one type to the other. Okay. Um, you know, let's walk you through the a couple of examples for binary and unary operator um, so here in this example I've got a distance class that has a feet and inch and then um, the constructor and then I've got a uh, the minus the, the 
reduction operator minus um, overloaded. Okay, so once the operator minus is called, it decrements uh, feet and inches by one. So feet is equal to feet minus one, inches equal to inch minus one. That's all it does. Um, so let me go ahead and run it. So when I started off, I started off at eight and nine. So I've had the unary operator um, minus. Um, the, I could have done the same thing with plus, right? I could have incremented plus versus decrementing. But this is just so you know. Uh, and if you didn't have the operator minus, it's not going to know what to do with class D1 once you say, my, you know, once you say minus D1. Um, binary operator, um, which is the plus over here, uh, same, same class, right? It's got, uh, two integer feet and inch, uh, constructor initializes the feet and, and takes in two integers and initializes, it, initializes its data members to them. Uh, so operator plus. So look what I'm doing in driver. Um, you know, I'm adding the two up, you know, just like how we did with strings. And all it is is it adds the feet and inches appropriately to its data member. So 18 and 11. All right, 10 plus 8, 9 plus 2. 10 plus 8 is 18, and then 11. There you have it. Uh, so that's it for this class. I will see you guys in the next class.